I'm your host. My name is Josh Wolf. I'm a developer advocate at Komunda, and I work on the ZB um, microservices orchestration engine. Now, let me just make sure that we got the right title happening in here for this uh, particular stream. Hmm. You're unable to follow this user, probably because it's me. Um, live now. Watch now. Does it say? Yeah, cool. It's got the right name. Falco and Josh do a deep dive into the ZB gateway. That's what we're up to today. So I'm just waiting for Falco to join. Uh, different link. Falco's just about ready. It's 6 a.m. where he is in the world. Different link for this one. And uh, it is currently 4 o'clock in the afternoon for me. You know, while I'm waiting for Falco to join, I might see if I can create some funky stuff here with my, uh, let's have a look, overlays. I can create overlays. What does this do? If I turn this on, ding, epic, um, ZB gateway. So it's a deep dive, deep dive. Mm, I'm going to use a hyphen, deep dive into the ZB gateway. I'm listening to uh, some Daft Punk on my headphones. And then I can move this like this. Oh, this is pretty cool. I'm, I'm digging this. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Can I make it bigger? Yes. Um, we can probably actually get rid of the word ZB at the beginning. Redundant. Like that. Deep dive into the ZB gateway. Cool. Can I make it centered? Centered would be better. Overlay style. Fixed position. Scrolling ticker. Oh, just what the doctor ordered. Yes. I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's good. What about if I put it up here? Like like this? Oh, no. I killed it. Um... Cool. Okay. How high can it go? Can it go all the way? That's how high it can go. Nothing can go all the way. Yes. Groovy. What else could I do? Mm. I can have a thing that says waiting for Falco. Deep dive into the ZB gateway. What font is that? Let's have a look. Uh, let's operate a mono medium. Let's try that. Save. Yes. That's kind of cool. I like it. It would be good to get some some cool uh, run scene. I'll spend a little bit of time making uh, making the various things about this cool. I've been working on a Slack uh, a Slack bot that we use in the ZB Slack. It's called the Archivist. And if you've recently joined the ZB Slack, we had like 20, 30 people join in the last month. You probably haven't heard of it, but you just tag any any conversation in any thread with at archivist and it sends it to the ZB forum. So I'm making a plan for how we close the loop on that. So it becomes like an artificial intelligence that answers people's questions. Because one of the things you notice over time of answering questions in Slack is that, you know, you get the same questions over and over again. And you could make an FAQ and then you're like, read, you know, read the FAQ to people. But if you can tell people to read the FAQ, why don't you get a robot to do that and then just answer their question from the FAQ? There you go. What else I can do with this? Let's have a look. Um, I can change the color temperature. Oh, it's hot in here. Freezing. Medium tint. 
I'm feeling jaundiced. I definitely had too much uh, chili to eat. Let's keep that in the middle. Negative three. Saturation. What does this one do? Mm. Oh, yeah. It's almost black and white. It is black and white. I'm in the 60s. Next thing you know, I'll be doing a moon landing. If only we had the technology to do that, hey? Gamma. That one I recognize from Doom. Quake. Yes, this makes it easy to see the monsters turn turn down the gamma. Actually, let's have a look. How does that look? Nah, it's fine the way it is. I'll just leave all those. Oh, look at this. I can rotate 180 degrees. Huh? I can even flip myself backwards. Okay, that's kind of weird. Like, I actually am literally looking over that way. Oh, that's cool. I quite like that. I quite like that mirror. See, now, yeah, it looks weird. It's backwards. Like, this hand is on the other side. Um, Deinterlace, what does that do? Nothing. Not sure what that does. Uh, I do notice, though, when I look at the edge of my chair that it's kind of like it's moving. So I think if I change my fade level of my green screen, now it's moving more. Now it's moving. Wah, now everything's moving. Mm. Maybe I can fix that with... What does this do? Transparent picture in picture? Nope. Blur the background? Ooh. Wow. Looks like I've got one of those expensive cameras that like can um, zoom in on you. That's pretty cool. I actually quite like that. Mask edges. What does that do? Hmm. Yes. Blurred background. Looks quite cool. I like it. I'm going to go with that. Use max resolution. What does that do? Let's try it. Nothing. I guess it's already using the max resolution. What happens if I change the resolution in StreamYard? Show advanced, standard definition. Let's go high def, 720p. Does that look any different? Not really. What if I use 720p and use max resolution here? Yeah, I don't know. Use manual focus. Let's try that. What does this do? Oh, blur the foreground. And then welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, like this. Start like this. Welcome. Set default camera. Yeah, okay, that's kind of cool. I'll just leave it like that. What have I done? Uh, I'll turn that off, turn this off. What does max resolution do? Not really much noticeable, so I'll just leave it off. Zoom and pan is good. Blur background, loving it. Green screen, of course. All good. Okay, so that's what that looks like. And then I've got my scrolling ticker, very important. What else can you do? Overlays. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I have this... Uh, secret overlay for when I'm entering uh, secrets in like code um, API keys and things. If I click this button here, ding, now you can't see anything. Actually, I should make it a little bit bigger. Can I do that? Mm, doesn't look like I can. Resize? 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 Nope. Okay. Can I change? Hmm. See if I can do this. Yeah, look at that. I can put that on top of the on top of the secret. Hmm. Turn that off. Now you can see me again. Cool. Falco has to reboot his machine. He's running um, Arch or Ubuntu, one of the Linuxes.
All right, we're going to go deep into the ZB gateway code today. That's what we're up to. So the way ZB is structured, it'd be great if I had an architecture diagram. I'm pretty sure there is one. Um, let's have a look. Let's see if we can get this to work. So if I go to the ZB docs, ZB, um, forward slash, no, it's docs.zb.io, docs.zb.io. And then here I can share my screen. Yes. Share the screen. Yep, share the screen. It's going to ask me which one I want to share. I'm going to share screen one. Okay, it goes on there. Wow. Very cool. All right. So let's have a look. Introduction. Uh, basics, architecture. Here we go. This is good. Let's blow this up a bit. Yes. Four main components in ZB's architecture, the client. So yesterday, Falco and I did a deep dive into the client, particularly the Java client. You can see here there's a Java client, there's a Go client. These are the two officially supported clients for for ZB. And then we have um, other clients, like I maintain the Node.js client, there's a Ruby client, there's a Ruby on Rails client. What else is there? There's a .NET client, I've written some stuff with that. Um, other clients. No, you can see them on awesome ZB. Oh, clicking on that wasn't a good idea. Um, if I go back here and then go close other tabs, let's clean this up a little bit. Too many things open. Closing Slack might help as well. But anywho, um, let's have a look at Awesome ZB. So on GitHub, there's a repo called Awesome ZB. Awesome ZB. See if it can find it. There we go. Hmm. There's actually a website called Awesome ZB and there's a GitHub. So it probably gets served from GitHub pages. And then I'd say it gets rebuilt on a push to master. I'm just guessing, but yeah, cool. Okay, so here you go. You got a Java client, a Go one, C sharp, Delphi, aka Delphi, um, Ruby, Node.js, Rust, Python, Workit, which is a Node.js TypeScript client which can work on both ZB and Commander. And then there's a ZB action, a ZB GitHub action. Yeah. So those are the client libraries that are available. And then you have the gateway, the broker, and the exporter. So the gateway is the actual component in the ZB cluster that the client talks to. And the gateway is responsible for all the gRPC communication with the clients. And then in the background, behind the gateway, you have the brokers. brokers. So when you get ZB, like the Docker container, or you, know, you just download the Java binary and you run it, it runs a broker with an embedded gateway. And you can cluster the brokers together and they each have a gateway in them and you can just talk to any of the broker gateways or you can run a standalone gateway and then have these brokers behind the gateway. And so the gateway distributes requests to the different brokers. And it has a few kind of characteristics of how it does that. Like it'll always deploy a new workflow, for example, to um, partition one on some broker. And then from there, the brokers will distribute the the deployed workflow definition to the other brokers in the cluster. And then these brokers are all, you know, if you've got them set up for replication, they're replicating events between them so that they have fault tolerance. But this component here, the gateway, and how it handles the this gRPC, these gRPC requests and how it distributes them to the broker, that's what we're going to take a look at today. Now, imagine if I tried starting... Um, IntelliJ right now, that would definitely 
tank my uh, tank my CPU. I might try it anyway since Falco's not here. Let me stop screen sharing. Let's see if we can pull this off without crashing everything. Try closing a few applications I have open. I'm going to keep Slack open because uh, my man Falco is going to hit me up in there if he needs anything. And I'll, I'll try starting IntelliJ. So there's a little box up here. Um, IntelliJ Idea Community. It says it can update, but I'm not going to try updating it. I'm just going to try opening it. Now, it's, when, it's probably when I open the ZB code base that it's going to freak out. Falco uses Eclipse, um, but I've, I mean, I've used Eclipse before in the past, but like 10 years ago. <laughs> IntelliJ. Yeah, I remember I was working on JBoss projects and uh, there was like a, a Red Hat JBoss developer studio, but none of the JBoss developers actually used it. They used IntelliJ instead. Okay, I've got the ZB client, Rust client open in here at the moment. So I'm going to close that and open the ZB code base. So let me cancel the um, preparation of that workspace. Uh, file open recent. It's got to be in my recent uh, recents for sure. NetBeans. Um, I've never used NetBeans before. Need for Eaters asking about NetBeans. Have never used. Falco, guten Morgen, mein Herr. Uh, hi. Good afternoon for you, right? And yeah. Yeah, whatever else the, the time zones might be. Hey, we have somebody. Uh -huh. This is awesome. It looks like we're looking at each other. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Let's do that then for the <laughs> for the whole for the for whole the thing. Setup. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment we put screen sharing on, we need to look up and down to make that effect work. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we want to talk to people like uh, Yo Need for Eat, what's happening, my man? <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Uh, cool. So you were already hacking something or? Ah, uh, you know, I just went through the architecture uh, diagram mm -hmm. That's in, good. The, in the documentation and, and I was just getting IntelliJ open to get the code up. But we can go with Eclipse if you like. Mm hmm we can. And actually, I have a bit of a add-on to what we did yesterday on the on the client side. Epic. So, um, can have a quick look into that, and it might be also a good starting point for today's deep dive into the gateway. Oh, do you see my scrolling ticker at the bottom there? Yes, I see it. <laughs> yeah, I think I need to raise it up a little bit now that we've switched this to two screen mode. Mm, two talking heads. I can just do this. I'll put it at the top. <laughs> Is that still StreamYard or you have other tools that you are? I'm using Ecamm e e Live with a mm -hmm. virtual camera so I can composite my uh, whole thing. Okay. Great. Um, let me get my screen on and show people something more interesting. Um, here we are. Uh, yeah, I'll do the full screen so I can also share some browser stuff if necessary. Yes. All right. So maybe as an entry point for the people who haven't seen the session from yesterday, um, this is a ZB client. Actually, it's the ZB Java getting started project. And this comes with a little Java application that yeah, creates a ZB client, then deploys a workflow. The workflow is fairly simple. Um, you bring that on. So we just have a simple sequence of service tasks um, with, with each of them having a different 
service type or job type to be executed. So, and the Java client will basically uh, deploy this process automatically. And when it's started, it will then create some payload and create a workflow instance, pushing in the payload and obviously starting the process by its name. And then um, the part that we found that we studied yesterday was how a worker gets created and then how all that is implemented together with the with um, polling and the execution of the jobs. So if anybody is interested in that, have a look at the uh, yesterday's recording. I think it was a bit lengthy with four and a half hours of a session, but um, it was quite a dissection of the worker, I think. Yeah, I'll take a bit of time to go through it and create like chapter markers. So I'll, I'll download it and then upload it to YouTube and put mm -hmm. chapter markers in it. And then, you know, I can turn it into a blog post and people can jump in at the point that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Might not hurt to maybe cut it a little at some points. <laughs> but uh, anyway. you know, then it will then it will go from being a four and a half hour job to being like a, you know, an eight hour job. You spend all the time <laughs> cutting it up and stuff. It's like, ah. Yeah, true. Okay. If there are anyway. chapter markers that they can click on, it'll start, you know. And cut just jump around. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, then, yeah, let's uh, look into this variation that I did yesterday in the, during my day. Um, so this is a job worker, right? So this is, first of all, registering a new worker for the payment service, which it happens to be our first service task in the process, right? We can see here in the property panel that the service task uses this job type. Mm. And then we have a handler function uh, or a lambda to be more precise. And this lambda, well, it, it's more like a simulation, right? It's just fetching some variables from the job, which is good. To, so we see how that works. Yes. Um, then does some sys out on my console and also calculates some price or actually just creates it. Um, and then, yeah, then, then completes the job back into ZB. And um, that's basically it. Um, well, I will come back to this code in a second just to finish the command here. Once the handler function is complete, we can then also define which variables to fetch from the engine. And then with open, the the worker actually starts his work. So this was kind of the, the code that we looked at yesterday where we looked into how the worker itself starts and how it gets then the jobs from the engine and so on. Um, yeah. Now there's one particular error condition that I wanted to catch mm. and we were fiddling with that a little bit yesterday. Um, so one thing is that our standard examples are usually working more in a synchronous way. I think I have the original or uh, one original variation still available here. Um, so you see here, this is another worker for the inventory service. And this actually uses the completion command with send and join at the end. And join, um, well, it says it's like get. So this is blocking and will throw runtime exceptions if necessary. Um, but yeah, this is blocking the thread here, which is which means if this takes a while inside ZB to complete, then um, it might not be super efficient. So we thought a better way would be to actually go and implement the job completion asynchronously. So we basically yeah, send it. And then after send, we, I think yesterday together, we already put the exceptionally block there. Mm. And well, then separate this a little bit. So well, I did something weird here because I wanted to test a particular error. And I wanted to test the error that happens when you complete a job, but the job is already completed by the engine. Mm. 
um, because, for example, another job has uh, another worker has completed a job, or for example, because the job got interrupted by a timer event. Right? I could have, for example, a, a timer boundary event here in my process, and then simply end it if I'm not receiving the money fast enough. That might actually be a quite real realistic example, and um, yeah, if that happens, the job that I have acquired in my worker, even if I'm working uh, on, on a normal pace, um, I might exceed this timer and then, um, yeah, the, the job cannot be completed anymore. And recently I had a customer that, that thought, okay, if something goes wrong in the worker um, or they're doing retries, you know, for example, you know, if they get a timeout from the from the engine, then maybe it's worth doing a retry. But what's a really bad idea is doing retries on the completion if the completion was failed due to the job being deleted. So that's an, an error that needs to be handled separately. I have something for you there. Mm -hmm. So job completions are never subjected to back pressure. I know. I have seen that bit. Um, you're probably referring, did I have that open? Yeah. So this is actually the, the GRPC documentation here for the error handling. Nice. And this one does say indeed what you mentioned uh, that uh, job completions and also job failing, like failing the job from the worker side will um, be, uh, they are whitelisted for back pressure. Mm. And that means those commands are always accepted. So that's indeed true. We don't have to worry about back pressure and at the completion, which makes it less likely that we have to retry. But there could be other reasons. For example, yeah, for some reason, the gateway is not available or something went wrong. Um, if we have completed a job, that usually means we have also done something in external systems. and we might not necessarily have a way to roll it back so the best way would be to to retry that and my customer of the other day did a retry where where they did like a 500 millisecond delay half a second delay mm -hmm. and then retry again and they did that in a loop for a hundred times and now if you are in that situation that your job has already been completed by another worker mm -hmm. or by a timer then this retry loop will still keep continuing um, to yeah, try and close this task with no success at all because the task is literally already gone. Even the, the entire process instance might already be gone. Um, but since the worker has the job ID, um, it can send a completion command on it. And which then the poor, the poor engine will just have to reject every little every time that it happens and just say, ah, oh, I searched for it, I didn't find anything. Sorry. Um, and now this could actually well, if it happens for a timeout, might not be that bad. It's some okay, some extra messages and my customer's case, a hundred extra messages. But maybe if it happens rarely, then it's not that bad. Um, where it's really bad is if you are in a high load situation where maybe due to the load that you have in the system, sometimes a job might exceed its uh, job timeout. Mm. Um, so you have a workflow that's not with a timer event here, but rather um, uses a, yeah, a timeout in the job worker. So if there's any misconfiguration that leads to, to workers exceeding their timeout, then another worker could complete the task at the same time. And then this overloaded system gets flooded with another 100 extra messages with this 100 retries, um, if you program it like that, to, to yeah, finish that task. So that's obviously not, not a good idea. So this error should be handled in a separate way. Therefore, um, I tried that here. I tried to simulate it here. By send by completing the same job twice, right? So I'm completing it here, and then once that was successful, I'm creating another completion command for the same job key, as you can see here, um, using the same variable. And yeah, could have probably even spared myself the payload, but anyway, I'm getting the full thing back in. 
and here then I have the exceptionally um, implemented getting the throwable in. And what I would expect from gRPC would be a status runtime exception. Mm. And um, then the status code of that uh, runtime exception will be, um, so actually one has to read it a little bit the other way around. So I'm then casting it once I detect at the type. Um, and then from that exception, I can receive the status code and then can match it against uh, the status code not found, which is the one we are expecting here. And um, maybe just to show you an example how this would look like. Um, I think I have that here. Yeah, nope. Bear with me for a second. Yeah, the error, error message will basically say that the job has not been found and therefore nothing could really be done. I should have put a comment in there. Yeah, uh, that would be cool to put into the TypeScript client, but I don't think you can, I don't think there's any idea of throws <clears throat> in TypeScript. I mean, and uh, whatever client you're writing, you should be able to see this uh, gRPC status code. So there's no need to have exceptions. Um, and it's really just you need to um, identify that status code. So that was a bit too much. <laughs> I had a copy of that exception, but we don't need the entire set phrase. So this is roughly how this would look like. Uh, let me wrap that uh, up. It's a design error in JavaScript, really. Untyped, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's an argument about like whether it's throwing is a good idea or whether you should return an exceptional result. But at mm -hmm. least in Java, you have typed exceptions, right? And you can put on the signature, you can say this thing can throw, you know, exception T, exception R, or exception S. Yeah, but that's rarely, well, there, there is an argument, a similar flame war, like exceptions versus return code. There's also a, um, an, a flame war in the Java community about runtime exceptions, which are, which are not needed, which you don't need to declare. Um, or oh. declared exceptions, which then you have to put on over, on every method uh, method signature. I think yeah. the tendency kind of goes towards runtime exceptions. Really? Yeah. So you basically just throw them, and if you decide to catch, then you catch, and if not, they they trickle up the stick. Yeah. Okay. At least that's what we are using in our products. Okay. Yeah. And in TypeScript, clutter is your signatures if you have those. Um, and it also forces you then to generate a lot of boilerplate. It does. I mean, if you take that functional approach and return an either, like either a result or an error, and mm -hmm. then, you know, compose things and then handle it at different, you know, wherever you need to. Anyway, it's as trickier to program. You can bang stuff out much faster like this, that's for sure. Although your programs might need more maintenance later and have more difficult bugs to track down. Mm -hmm. I'm because I'm just thinking how I'm going to implement this in my client because this is this looks to me like to be a good idea because people come back with this uh, question all the time. You know, they're like this. Um, you know, I get this message saying that the job you know cannot be found, and you've written a, a you know a message that explains some of the things that might have happened, so it gives them a sense of how they can debug what's happening or understand what's happening rather than just saying, couldn't find it. Something is wrong, you know? Mm. I like I like that. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah, in fact, so when you get this particular error from the broker, that means you can just ignore it. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just printing it out a little bit. The method message itself will look like this. Um, 
status exception not found will tell you that this got rejected because this job key does not exist in the engine anymore most likely because well you got it from the engine if it's not there yet anymore then it got deleted either by a service task that got interrupted that's what i also kind of put in here it as a bit of an explanation could be a boundary bend could be an event sub process or maybe simply the process has been canceled using operate and well the other likely reason is that another job has already completed the same job and therefore um, probably this worker has exceeded the job timeout otherwise another worker would have not gotten access to the job mm. Yeah, and in any other case, um, yeah, I'm just throwing the exception to whoever would like to catch it, or if not, then yeah, I think if I don't catch it anywhere, it just disappears because they, I don't have any exception handlers around it here. So that was a bit funny when I when I wrote this the first time. Nothing really happened. Um, it's the the runtime exception. Yeah, was just disappearing was also mm. not printed or anything. But that's OK, because due to the asynchronous nature of this code, um, the the method that I have here, my, my application itself is not directly in the loop. Um, yeah, so now obviously this whole code ideally should just be one completion of the message um, uh, of the job and then has this exception handler in there. Okay, um, that's this little bit. Now, shall we move into what we actually wanted to do today, which means looking at how the gateway side of these things look like. Yeah, let's check it out. And maybe let's think what are our research questions here, why we are doing this, this review. Um, so we have seen yesterday how the worker behaves and that the worker has the, the option to query for yeah pretty much also a larger amount of, of work at the same time so for example by default um, when i start a worker with the default settings then it would ask immediately for 32 jobs to be assigned to it and if you have um, capacity limitations the as the java worker is implemented right now you can um, you can increase the number of maximum active jobs and the number of threads but that would also lead to a really big number of requested jobs inside uh, inside the engine because essentially what we looked at yesterday was that the implementation in the job worker when it activate um, it activates jobs it will basically take um, the maximum active jobs minus the currently active jobs and then that will be the uh, number of jobs to be activated and that's yeah potentially a, a pretty high number and we were wondering whether that has an impact on for example, in the gateway, that the acquisition itself takes longer. So we would like to understand how how does the gateway go through the partitions and when does it stop to send out a response. We were also looking yesterday a little bit into the job polling, and we could already see that the poller itself is implemented in a way that looks like a like a streaming implementation. So um yeah for example here we see this on next message that uh, receives the activate jobs response and i'm not sure if that is just because of the long polling it needs to be implemented using such a streaming implementation or if there's actually a chance that th this response comes multiple times from a single acquisition yeah so, so we want to see that <clears throat> how the streaming takes place and then how they're collected off those partitions, right? If it if it rotates them, or if it's like, can you saturate a partition? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, indeed. So like, would if if the first partition has 
thousands of jobs would we always get the ones from that partition first until that is empty and then go to the next one that, yes that wouldn't sound like a very efficient or a very very um sensible implementation actually is it by partition or by broker um no it is by partition that that part we already know um we stumbled okay. over this comment uh, in the docs yesterday already so the the activate jobs rpc which is the, the grpc message um has a small bit of documentation that explains that it iterates through all known partitions in a round robin manner so that means one by one sequentially right. And then when it's after the last one, it will start with the first one again. And yeah, it activates up to the requested maximum and then streams them back to the client as they are activated. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting things in there, right? Like if you do round robin, what do you do between requests? Like, do you remember which ones you stop with when the next request comes in? But then if you remember that, you need to remember it for every job type because if somebody comes in with a different job type then whatever you remember it might not be so relevant or maybe it could still balance across job types i don't know um yeah and then also the handling of this maximum if i come in and ask for a thousand jobs will that mean it, it, the gateway waits until a thousand jobs are available or will i at least force the game probably that doesn't happen um but um, would a, a request of 1,000 jobs mean that we have to wait until we really try it every partition before we send out a response because we are really trying to fill up 1,000? That, I think, is a, is a likely thing. But yeah, let's have a look at the detail to see if, the, if we can find out in the code. And this is completely un unprepared, just as a disclaimer. So uh, I think... So we have no idea what we're doing. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I'm just going to go and see makeup and see if uh, if they can do something about this kind of like shiny thing I got going on here. <laughs> I'll be back in a second. <laughs> All right. That gives me some time to dig out the ZB code and I'll actually just refreshed it as well just so we have the latest and greatest now oh, wait obviously Nice. So that was a day's work of the ZB team. <laughs> because we did that same pull around about the same time yesterday. So now where would we need to look? Probably in the broker. Um, yeah, let's open projects. It has a slight risk that stuff gets busy here. But we might need some of it. Ah, actually, broker was the wrong one already. We want to obviously look at the gateway. Let's close some stuff here. So, um, yeah, the, so the gateway itself is, uh, as we can see right at the beginning, a gRPC server. So its main role is to receive requests from the clients and then talk to the brokers and um, 
yeah, respond, get a response from the brokers. So the gateway is also responsible to really understand the topology of the current cluster. So if you have multiple brokers, the gateway is the piece that knows all the brokers, has contact, has connections open to all the brokers and can then, yeah, for example, in case of a job acquisition, ask all the brokers if they have jobs for this particular job type that is coming in. So let's see what we are looking at. Um, this is already interesting, activate jobs handler. Um, so I guess we won't read through all of it, but rather look at dedicated pieces that are interesting to us. And um, I happen to know that this is an, a bit of an active component inside um, the, the gateway because it's yeah, you might think that job acquisition is just, you know, there's an incoming request. You look through the, the brokers and then you re have you have an answer with the jobs that you received. But due to the long polling nature that we have in uh, in the gateway, this needs to be a bit of a more active component. So because the idea is that if we don't have enough jobs immediately when uh, a job acquisition request comes in. We will keep that request open and then continuously, um, or we will actually wait for jobs to come in from um, the brokers. And then once we have jobs, we will get them out. And that kind of involves polling every now and then to see if there's any new jobs coming in. So the same, the similar polling that the client is doing, we will do in the gateway as well, but on a different level. And that's why this guy here comes into play. Um, yeah, I can actually have a look into it already. I think, I think I will revert my decision to open all the projects. Hey, do you know there? Yeah, I, I couldn't fix it in makeup. I just fixed it with the uh, light temperature <laughs> or the light brightness. Check this out. Watch this. You ready? Watch the background. <laughs> See, but like this, it looks like I got one of those super cool cameras that can like focus on the foreground, you know, like depth of field. Boom. <laughs> and that's a fake break background anyway. Hey, no, that's 100% real. It's just not where I am. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, intermission for a second. Check this out. So this is the this is the error message that comes back from the um from the broker chat. Like this show. Mm -hmm. That's the error message that comes back from the broker. Now what I did is in my in my complete job command in the um in the node client, I, I detect if it's that status code five, and then I um I add on to the end of the message. Look at this. This is what the error message now looks like in the node client. So let me hide this one. And now what you actually get when it throws is this. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's good that, that you do that on the client. Why didn't you just submit that as a pull request to the to the server? I, I was just I was just thinking that while I was uh, in makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, indeed. And uh, well, next thing is, and I, maybe that's what you are already thinking about is that error message or that error in particular is so specific that actually the clients could just handle it themselves like the client um the the client ap uh, api that we provide right we could just have just a, ignore uh, it basically right so do you need to see that does the user ever need to see that error or could we just could i swallow it 
if it's error code five? Um, I think it could make sense to expose it just as an a FYI, where you were too late, um, right? That because that has an implication if, if that is due to the config to a configuration mistake. Because, for example, I put my job time out too low, then it is relevant. But hmm, or no, nay, I think what I'm saying is what yeah, our clients could handle is the retrying of other types of errors. Because, for example, um, yeah, on back pressure. I mean, back pressure in general would be a topic for the clients to handle automatically, right? Have the right algorithms in place to to back off in a similar way how the broker emits the back pressure. Yes. And yeah, in that case, then any retry behavior would have to leave out this particular error. Yeah, it does that now in my client. I guess the other thing is with this wording here that, that I went with where it says, or the job completed by another worker, if you're only running one worker, it's not actually another worker that completed it, right? It's this worker completed it, but in another, I don't know how you would language that because that would be confusing to someone if they see that and they're like, I'm only running one worker. How could this happen? I'm not sure if it can happen by the same worker oh definitely multi-threading or in the node case you know like the event loop it, it activates it once it times out on the server it makes it available for reactivation the same worker reactivates it in another thread mm, yeah true obviously the same worker could could run it because from a zb point of view it forgot completely about the worker that acquired it before um job was already completed need for eight yeah. reckons i mean that's pretty straightforward it's like they might still be left wondering like how did that already get completed but yeah mm -hmm. uh, okay so i'll just yeah, say the so job already completed no i think it's fine to mention another worker maybe put threat in brackets <laughs> you're multi-threaded then that's kind of another thing i don't know and it might even be worthwhile mentioning the job timeout or just put a link to the documentation in there to be super verbose oh epic yeah that sounds like a plan not sure what would be a good page there I mean, the gRPC error handling would explain um, what's going on with this message. So, no, uh, no, actually not. I needed to really write the example in order to see what's the exact message. It's uh, it wasn't so easy to find in the in the docs. Oh, yeah. Okay. I could put it as a forum post or a blog post, and then just link to that. Yeah, or have a look where it could fit in the documentation and push it there. The only thing about that is that documentation is really um, vulnerable to unstable uh, URLs. Whereas like a forum post is like more forever than docs, especially because I know for a fact that we're about to restructure the docs completely. We're going <laughs> to merge the ZB docs and the Kamunda Cloud docs in the next couple of weeks. It's one of my tasks for this week, building the plan for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think forum actually would be good because I could write small kind of explanations for error messages, put them in the forum posts and then just link to the forum post in the client. I actually started for myself a collection of exception messages and their explanation just because yeah, sometimes you see stuff in a in a log file and you see it once a year and then it's hard to remember what it was exactly and then you need to dig. So mm. like things that happen frequently in the in the use of ZB could deserve some kind of FAQ style collection. 
Yes. And that could even go further into general failure modes, not even just exceptions, but what, what other failures could be there. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, as we go in, because that, that error that gets returned gets returned in the ZB gateway, so maybe we can update the error message while we're in there looking at it. Mm, nope. That one comes from the broker. Okay. <laughs> in that case, I'm just going to open it as an issue, <laughs> and then someone who knows where it is can find it. Just search it using code search. Okay. Let me see if I can get the code base up without. Okay. Yeah, no, let me not do that now. Yeah, okay. It's tempting, I'll... tempting to do a quick pull request, but then we've seen yesterday how that can. <laughs> yes, expl explode the scope. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man, it is a, a potentially interesting bit of code to to review. I you know what? I think I have that open. Uh, was it this one? No. Because I did search for the error message in the code yesterday. Okay. And look at this. So, um, let's see. Oh, there we are. So that's the original message. Um, yeah, it just tells you that no job was found. Mm. Not necessarily what could be an explanation of it. Expected to find job. But no, this one says expected to complete job. So it's actually uh, coming from somewhere else. Ah, yeah, there are two variations of it. That's true. Uh, let me just open my client again. job this is kind of cool because i've got uh i've got your screen on a monitor where when i'm looking at it it looks like i'm looking at it <laughs> well Full of full string. Here we are. Complete job test. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. It exists as a test case, but it doesn't exist directly as a string. Templated, eh? Maybe. Let's try this. There we are. Uh, no, that's the test again. Expected JSON TV jobs. Yeah, you see, it just then takes longer. It's probably something that's manufactured from some request builder that then reports an error. Hang on a yeah. second. This one here. No, 
No, nah, no. It's just somewhere deeper. Yeah, and one can even argue whether the exception message must be pointing out all possible reasons. At, at some point, it could become a moving target to update that error message because if there's some other way how a, a job could be interrupted, then, you know, you're, you're writing documentation inside your error message rather than writing mm -hmm. it somewhere where it belongs. So <clears> yeah. just saying, hey, the job is not there, that that is technically the right answer. But obviously, it's always good if, if exceptions would lead people to understand what's going on. Link to the forum. I got gotcha. you. OK, well, let's come back to our gateway. Because oh, we might need a while to understand this behavior. So we have already seen when the gateway is started, there is um, this jobs handler. I think, oh yeah, this, this might already be interesting because this is directly invoked with an activate jobs request. And then a stream observer jobs well is this a client side request I guess so yeah mm. oh yeah and there are two of them there is a round robin without long polling and then there's the long polling variation mm. this is just like give me what have you got right now mm-hmm Oh yeah, I think this is already pretty good. This is right what we want to see. So let's first look into the hopefully easier version, the round robin activate jobs handler. Um, we're coming in here with an activate job request, which is yeah really the gRPC request. I get, don't have the gateway protocol here. Let's open that. I saw that as a project, here we are. Nope. Hmm not helpful. Well, who cares? It's going to be the gRPC thingy. Let's not worry about it. Um, so then we do get the topology. This is very important because, um, as we said, we had we might have multiple brokers to talk to. Um, and you, I like what you did earlier, that you had a picture for people to look at. Uh, <laughs> That's not what I wanted, but this is something, right? So um, we have, maybe let's just more put it like this. We have a client, client talks to the gateway and then the gateway needs to know the cluster. Let's assume we have, for example, three nodes as in this picture, then any of them could be um, having data for us. So maybe also a picture to remember is how, Usually we distribute different partitions to different nodes. Maybe this is even a better picture here. So this is maybe more a stylistic impression here with five nodes. And I tried to highlight here how each partition has a leader and potentially multiple followers. But this is also to illustrate replication. But what you can see here also is that then um, each broker is the leader in this case for one partition. So in order to find all the jobs in the system, we need to talk to every partition leader in the topology and ask if there are jobs available. You know what would be good for this uh, diagram? Yes. Is if you make one of the brokers 
a leader of two partitions and one of the brokers just a pure follower. Hmm. Why would that be good? Because that's because. how it actually works in reality. <laughs> And people expect it to be like this. They expect partition leadership to be evenly distributed in the cluster, and it's not. Um, yeah, although we are trying to balance it out a little bit. so We are trying, but in practice, like people continually are saying, like, there's something wrong because one of my brokers is not doing any work. Yeah. Well, one common misconception is that being a follower is somehow easier. And it's not. So if you are following a partition, it still means that you have to get the events that are coming in, write them to disk in a log stream, and then also process them to the extent that you have to build the RocksDB database state locally. So oh, really? Not, yeah, of course. Because the whole idea of following a partition is that you are able to take over in case the leader dies. And the best mm. way to take over is to be Doing really it. up to date, right? Have the RocksDB state processed. Yes. Otherwise, if you um, if you don't do that, then yeah, then you would take over as a leader. And first of all, you have to process fifteen minutes worth of uh, of data from the last snapshot, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, and being um, and and that's what we see usually when we do um, sizing of a cluster and the configuration. We actually put CPU threads and, and we reserve vCPUs for the partitions that we are following. So if you enable replication, you need to have basically three times the amount of hardware. Three times. Okay. Like if you go from re replication factor one to replication factor three, you will want to um, have either three times more CPUs or um, alternatively, you cut your number, uh, you, you divide your number of partitions by three and then use fewer partitions. Mm. Okay. So you would want to have roughly, in theory, one vCPU per partition replica that you have in your system. So in this case, we have five partitions. Each of them has three replicas. So we want to have... Um, we, so we need 15 vCPUs. In this case, for example, we could run each node with three vCPUs, and that would then process these partitions in a good way. OK, um, so now, now that we understand the theory, we understand also that the gateway really has the job to go to all brokers. Um, do I have a picture in here? Yeah, exactly, nice. <laughs> Um, so the gateway will then talk to all the leaders in the topology and ask each leader, do you have jobs? And as the name of this class suggests, we're doing that in a round robin fashion. That means we talk to the first one first and go through the list. And um, yeah, first we get the topology. We uh, get the number of partitions out of it. And then we trigger Another method is called or activate jobs as well. It's probably the one that comes right below. Exactly. Um, and here we see then we have a partition ID iterator. And what is this type? Let's see. That's the request. The type is request get type, okay. That would probably give us something like the job activation. Let's see, do we have, Hmm, how do I get my source code for this? It sounds like there are no snapshot source bundles available for this from Maven. Download sources. Because it's a snapshot. Ah, you know what we will do? We'll just go 
to not work with a snapshot and just work with the latest release. And then we have okay. source code um, branch. Yeah, I actually found a thread in the um, in the forum asking exactly about this error message. Why am I getting <laughs> this error message from January? Nice. So I'm just going to add at the end of the thread like a crisp explanation of it, and then I'll link to that in the error message. Boom. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to have my my text maybe from what I have been wrote, writing up? Yeah. What do you got? So you guess you have the error message anyway, and uh, this was kind of my explanation here. I will paste that in Slack. Okay. Wait. Wrong Slack channel, as always. When you quickly want to paste something, here you go. Thanks. Okay, back to switching branches. Uh, what would we want? Technically, I would want to have a tag. Ah, oh, yeah, there they are. That list could take a little longer to load. Wow, all the way back to 0 0.1. That would be fun stuff to review. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the latest 25 alpha 2 and we're getting the typical warning that we cannot commit to this. And we already see Maven downloading all the stuff in the background. And with a little bit of luck, this should then give us access to the code of this class. Now we, we saw it. Nice. This is how it needs to work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes the, the jump point doesn't work immediately if the source code is not yet downloaded. Okay. Uh, it's still looking a little weird. Job type. Ah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yes. So um, nicely fits our example. <laughs> Payment service it happens to be the job we have in our process as well. It's the hello um, world. It's it's literally the hello world of BPMN, isn't it? The the e-commerce. <laughs> the e the order process is kind of quite typical. Um, the the other co competitors there would be the uh, loan request, the loan approval, and maybe the vacation approval. But you see a pattern there, right? Yes, <laughs> okay. human human workflows or e-commerce workflows. Oh. Okay, so payment service. So that would be our job type here, and then there's just some. Um, Typecasting. So this is interesting because we directly understand what job type we are working on here. And apparently, yeah, we are getting a partition iterator for that type. And that sounds almost like what I mentioned earlier that we, we might be me memorizing here for each job type, which partition we've been on exactly here. Um, next partition supplier, job type to next partition ID. Compute if absent, take the job type. Um, new round robin dispatch strategy. Wow. Probably means simply get the partitions and read through it. 
but then somehow we do remember where we were. This is pretty interesting. So it sounds, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, right? But this code reads to me like we indeed remember which partition we were. So that next time when we come back with the same job type, we would remember where we left off and then we would continue with another partition and not just ask the same partition all over again. I think it's just mandatory for, for load balancing at this point. Good. Okay, so once it gets full it uh, for the activation request, it will move to the next partition. Um, well, this doesn't tell us anything about full here. It would simply say, well, we have an iterator and we um, we remember for, for each job type what was the last partition that we worked with so that then we would go to the next partition when uh, when we have the next job request. Okay. So even if partition one still has a bunch of jobs on it, the next time you ask, it's gonna start with partition two. Exactly, because that is the only thing that's fair. If all the partitions are fairly full, you wanna get some jobs from each rather than going one partition first. That is really important. Otherwise you would overload one broker um, with all the work and the other ones would starve out. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It'll lead to an average latency. Exactly. If you have if you have a um, a, a time sensitivity in your workload, that would be paramount. Um, okay. Let's just navigate back to where we came from. We've seen here there's this partition iterator for each job type. So this will definitely consume some memory to remember it. If you have a huge number of job types, that might be a topic. But since usually there's a countable number of, of workflow models, which only a countable number of jobs inside or service tasks inside them, it's probably not that bad. And it's really just a string and a, only a, a number or something that gets memorized here. So then um, we have our maximum jobs to activate. So this is coming from the client request. Um, and we've seen that logic yesterday, how that gets calculated. So for example, by default, we would have um, 32 maximum jobs that can be active in a worker. And in the first request, it would ask for 32, and then it would only ask for the um, remaining jobs that are missing. And due to this limit of 30% uh, capacity, we, should, we will probably come in with around 20 most of the times as a request. So now if I have a broker with five partitions, as my example was, uh, uh, Um, or let's take three. Um, no, I think we need partitions. Let me go to the other diagram again. So in this case, yeah, we have five partitions. That means our iteration size will be uh, five and we can go through it. And yeah, if we are asking for 30 tasks, 30, jo 30 jobs, depending on what's the workload, um, could be we find 30 in the first partition then we are done. If not, we would move on to the next one and to the next one until we get 30. At least that sounds how it how it could be. And, and that's a really important point. So if I'm asking for a lot of jobs to activate, I'm really interested to understand if that would slow me down, if that would lead to very long running job activations because I have to go and search through all partitions. Mm. Uh, But yeah, so they're done in, and they're done in series, aren't they? They're not done in parallel. 
Yeah, it's round robin, and they are done uh, subsequently. I think that's the word. Yeah, until you fill up the uh, basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's drill deeper in the code. This is just handing parameters to the next implementation, um, which would say, what is this? On response, on completed, and then set some things to false. Pull previous partition and resource exhausted was present. This is interesting. Apparently there, there are some extensions already in here that could be leveraged. Mm. Um, okay, here we see remaining amount and remaining amount, where is that defined? Comes in, yeah, initially remaining amount is set to Max jobs activate, right? No, where does that come from? Ah, yeah, oh, here it is. <laughs> this one has max jobs to activate, and then down there it's called remaining amount. So this let's to take the example, right? We're coming in with our first request from the client, and default was 32. So we would come in with a remaining amount of 32 jobs, which is bigger than zero. Um, and what is this? Okay, if previous partition is true, then we would go and ask the same partition ID again. Um, otherwise, we would check if there is another partition and then continue. So this is already interesting. Apparently this iterator goes through the list once and then if it stops because it doesn't have another partition, that would probably break the loop here. Uh -huh. Here we see a comment, enough jobs activated or no more partitions left to check. Right. That would mean in, in return, if I have many partitions and I'm asking for a lot of jobs that could lead to going through a lot of partitions because I'm either, so my example that, that my customer came up with uh, um, that I'm working with right now was that um, they have quite a high load. So they, tr they try to have really big workers that have a lot of resources, kind of work vertically scale them. So they have a thousand th uh, threads available in the worker and they're therefore to fill that thousand th threads, they would also, uh, and the, the workload is IO based, which I think is true for many workers that they have um, IO bound workloads, which are benefiting from a large number of threads. Um, yes. So long story short, we're coming in here with a, um, job acquisition request of 1,000 jobs that we would like to have activated, which gives us a long search time because we have to search for, to, to we would stop if we have 1,000, that would definitely be a limit. Um, or um, the other things. Or partitions. Or partitions, yeah. And I think their current, favorite setup is to have 45 partitions and they're even testing with bigger numbers like with 60 for example and okay so lower, he, lower. this is an opportunity then for machine learning machine learning adaptive <laughs> yes machine learning it has to be machine learning in the client because it can it can measure the amount of time it takes the activation request and say well what happens if i ask for less jobs you know and then it can like figure out what the right balances yeah the problem right now as i see it and we can we can continue this review is that um, the maximum jobs to activate is just computed flat by the number of remaining slots that are available on the execution site and 
I think this should be configurable. And uh, I'm thinking about it because that's how, how it used to be in Camunda BPM um, for the job executor that we have there. And there it seemed to be beneficial to, to de decouple yeah, your Jim capacity and... from what you request. So you can configure that you rather have some smaller requests that maybe complete faster and fill your queue faster than if you, you know, if you have a big worker pool and you you activate large chunks, then that will give you a delay. At least if you are sensitive to latency, that's a problem. And obviously, my current customer is <laughs> sensitive to that. So, yes. Um, yeah. That's where, what we're looking at. So let's let's review this and then maybe come back to a, yet another pull request for the client, I guess. To decouple those two. Yeah, exactly. Make it configurable. Um, <clears throat> exactly this number, the max jobs to activate. So then mm. I could balance it out and say, okay, maybe I have a thousand threads and I'm fine to have thousand jobs active in my worker, but my acquisition size is only, let's say, 50 or 100. And then I would, well, with, uh, how would that look like? Yeah. So what would happen then is maybe if I also have 45 partitions, let's say, and I'm, uh, then, then I could ask for, uh, let's say, 50 20. jobs um, or 20 jobs. And that would mean I just go to maybe one, two, three partitions, get 20 jobs together and send it out so the client can continue working on them. If I go through all the partitions one after another, this is almost guaranteed to um, to take a lot of time. Yeah, you, you'll have a minimum response time that you'll never be a floor. You'll never be able to go faster than that. However long it takes to go around all the partitions. Yeah. The other thing is that also as your system starts to slow down, and the partitions take longer to respond, everything will start to slow down. Yeah. Let's say let's say that your workers are not completing the jobs fast enough, everything's starting to back up. And now because you're you're taking so long to get the the jobs from the from the broker and then do them and then complete them. Mm, oh yeah, that would only be a very specific case actually when there's like a very high throughput of starting, well, would that actually slow it down though? If you, if you had lots of jobs appearing, what, what's, what's the actual highest cost actions or activities on the broker? Do we know? Job activation is among the, the highlights because <laughs> okay. it's a, it's a complex command. It's a batching different, um, different jobs into a single message. So there's some processing involved. Um, and obviously the alternative would be to just scale the workers and have many, many small workers, but that is a big waste of resources because um, if you are IO bound, you don't need, um, you don't need to waste all that memory. At least, you know, if you, for example, if the worker is a Java application, you have to, if you want to run many replicas of it, then um, yeah, you're wasting a lot of memory. And then, then it would also lead to many smaller requests coming in. You know what you could do? You know how you make the, um, if we decouple these two things, decouple the acquisition size and the maximum capacity. And then what we do is when the client starts, we have a query the topology of the broker cluster and then make the right choice. Mm. But what would you do based on the topology? Well, you know how many partitions there are. No, but you don't know the filling level of the partitions. But if there are three partitions, you could ask for a thousand jobs every time, no problem, right? Because there's probably not going to be a thousand jobs available, but it's going to not take long to go through three partitions. But if there are 45 partitions, you want to drop your acquisition size. 
Mm, yeah, it could still take uh, a long time to uh, to activate a thousand jobs with uh, you know simply the effect that you have the broker has to wait for the thousand job jobs active. to come back. Yeah, you need you need to write thousand events to the event log that the jobs have been activated. That's also stuff that gets. Yeah, written to the event stream, then it gets replicated because <laughs> yes. it's a and then, but going on. By the time you get the jobs back, the first one is timed out. <laughs> it's been yeah. and then it's available for reactivation again on the broker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this is what we seem to see that the, the time <clears throat> um, that the, the there is some artificial delay in there. And that's why I'm kind of doing this review here to understand what's going on in the gateway and make better choices. And one thing could be delay. Yeah, there, there, there is no explanation for the delays we're experiencing there. They are mm. likely not being caused by the broker in this case and not caused by the, um, by the worker itself as well. So I'm suspecting that maybe our acquisition scheme is not ideal and that causes delays. Okay. Because it, you pay for it twice, right? First of all, uh, you're having one request for the job acquisition that takes a long time, but then you pay uh, basically toll per, per each job because that means also each workflow instance, even if it got acquired, if the job got acquired, just got that penalty of maybe a couple of hundred milliseconds, maybe even longer. So this could actually lead to a quite long delay. Now, yeah, mm. well, let's let's understand it first to be really sure. Um, it, it, we, I think we see already here, um, at least the code comments seem to point for it, that we really wait for all those jobs or for the partitions to be cycled through. Let's see what's going on here. Um, then we have a partition ID and we have max jobs to activate. Ah, look at this. Now we have a broker activate jobs request. Was that the case all the time? No, it wasn't. <laughs> look at this here. We're getting an activate job request from the gRPC gateway protocol. And then mm. it's being mapped by a request mapper into a broker activate jobs request. And this is taking the job type, the job timeout and the worker name. Those are all things that are written into the activation because ZB will remember when uh, which broker has acquired it and also when what timeout it defined. And also we will tell this broker um, the same number, right? So if we coming in here with, let's go with the default 32, we will try on the first broker that we talk to, if that broker could have 32 jobs for us. Okay. We also pass in the variables, the variable list. So this is not, um, this is just the list of variable names to be precise. So that means when we receive the response, we will only receive those variables that we needed for this worker and not the entire set of potentially yeah, dozens of variables, maybe with big payloads on site. So this is really good. And I think our application makes that as well, um, right? So in our case, we just need the order ID in our little payment service worker. And by setting fetch variables order ID, we instruct the, the broker to just provide that order ID and nothing else. So for example, we had an array in, in, in the process with the order items. And for the payment, we don't necessarily need the, li the list of items. We might just need the, the price or something like that. Or actually, yes, simply the order ID might be sufficient because if a payment arrives, it probably uses the order ID as a, as a key. And that's enough for us to correlate a payment. All right, um, back to this thing here. Yeah, the request mapper just takes that all in. And then we have a broker activate job request. 
And this will, this is no longer gRPC, by the way. Um, the broker and the gateway talk a binary protocol with each other. And um, yeah, just uh, payload is kind of similar to what we have received from the client. What's that binary protocol called again? No idea. Binary protocol? <laughs> <laughs> broker gateway protocol? No. Uh, do I know that somewhere? I remember I talked about it when I first uh, got involved in the project with Mensky. He told me what it was. Oof. Was it message pack? Could that be? Yes, that's it. It's message pack. Oh, yeah. I thought that had been replaced by gRPC, but maybe it hasn't. So we are using gRPC on the client side and then message pack to the broker. I think I don't have that detail here. No, this is more focusing on the algorithms. Okay, anyway. Um, I mean, at this level, it's just a Java object. We don't have to care how it gets transported. Um, but then interesting is we will have, we have a consumer here and that consumes a gateway activate jobs response. So we probably then also have to map that somehow. Be consumer. Let's see. Ah, yeah, here we go. Um, feels quite similar to the client API. Let's actually start here, right? So we have a broker client. We send the request that we have prepared. That's done asynchronously here and whenever it's completed we will get a response which will be a job batch record response so it will be single response containing a batch of jobs we will take that response and map it to an activate jobs response for the gateway protocol so this will then be a grpc response again And now yeah, we see it here even with the variable names. And now we are checking if the jobs count in that response is greater than zero. Then we will accept it. What is this on response thing? Um, that was our consumer, consumer. here. Great. So this will get there and this is interesting because that was one thing that we wanted to see how is the streaming behavior and it sounds to me like we're taking whatever we got if it does have jobs we directly push it out to the client let's see what this is doing okay that's obviously quite generic it's too much um Uh, well, consumer here. Is this still. Let's see if we can find the actual implementation that's being used here. Lots of options. This one sounds, this has something with job handler in here. Okay, this is for a completion. Mm. Ah, wait, that's my, that's my client consumer. No, not exactly what I was looking for. Hmm, is that somehow defined here? Activate jobs handler, broker client. Oh yeah, wait. Uh, 
here, response observer on next. That's what is our ops, uh, our consumer. And this is passed in here. Um, see when it's invoked. One reference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stream observer. I mean, maybe there is not much to it because it's simply. So this seems to be a bit of a message dispatcher. Um, we are getting in with an activate jobs <coughs> method. Then yeah. we will call activate jobs. And yeah, you basically pass in the low level gRPC stream observer, which handles the yeah. piping the stuff out. But that doesn't tell you whether it waits till the stream is complete. Maybe we can have a quick look into the stream observer. Receives notifications from an observable stream of messages. It's both used by client stops and service implementations. This explains why we have seen the stream observer and the client yesterday already. Yeah. And um, it's used for all message type, including unary calls. For outgoing message, stream observer is provided by the gRPC library to the application. Okay. Incoming message, the application implements the stream observer. So, I mean, essentially, they're delegating the the buffering of the of this to this library because it's it's streaming it straight out of the gRPC, but it must be buffering it in the client until it completes, and then it calls the handler. Mm. At least that's how it works in Node. I'm certain because my my client implementation is basically like on data, and that data event only fires when all of the jobs are there. Hmm. So, yeah, depends. Man. Uh... Let me double check that. I'm I'm ninety percent sure though. Clients may invoke at most ones. Uh, servers may invoke on next at most ones for client streaming calls, but may receive many on next callbacks. Mm -hmm. What? Servers may invoke on next, and I think we, we had on next here, right? Wasn't it? Where were we? Exactly. Response observer on next is the thing. But it sounds to me like we're doing it here for sure, and then we go back to activate jobs. With remaining amount. So this is a loop. <clears throat> and that is kind of what was mentioned somewhere in the docs as well, that we're actually streaming the stuff out. Um, this this uh, on response dot accept. So is that the accept method of the on next method? Yes. So we passed in stream observer on next, and then we called accept on that. Yeah? Yes. OK. So accept can obviously be called more than. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> What's the return value? Uh, sounds like void here. That's but weird. we didn't even we didn't even call it. I'm confused. <laughs> so it sounds like if I'm coming in here. Uh, 
we will have activate jobs. Yeah, we will get an activate jobs stream observer as a response observer. And then we just pass a method handle here. Which gets which is then the consumer here, right? Yeah. But I think that's just a fancy way of accepting that as a method handle. Yeah. So and then we the pass consumer it interface is basically, um, if I call accept on that, um, I think that should call it, right? Maybe. Let me have a look at my gateway source. Well, we can have a look what's pa what's being passed on here. Haha, <laughs> look at this. This is it is. Um, when we do activate jobs next time, we now then get the wait. I oh, know it's still one response. We're just looping in here. Hmm. So that means it's calling itself by recursion goes back in here again. If remaining amount is, is still bigger than zero, then we will go to the next partition. Do the same thing again there. And once the jobs return from that partition, on response will be called again. And that sounds to me a little bit like a streaming behavior. And um, when you tried this, was this only a single broker with a single partition? Could that be a reason why the request was completely closed? <clears throat> um, I don't know. Or could I, it I be that your client implementation of the gRPC client that you're using is, is, is exposing you to the streaming in a way that you just get the entire stream complete as a, as a string or something like that? Yeah, uh, that's what I think it is. Yeah. So, but for example, uh, yeah, this, this kind of feels to me, I mean, there was this thing that can only be called once. Let's read this line again. Um, servers. Okay, but servers may invoke on next at most once for client streaming calls. but may receive many on next callbacks. Ah. Okay. I'm not sure if I understand client and server and callback here. Uh, the, is, that I callback don't. <laughs> is that a callback from the server implementation or is that a callback from the client side? It sounds to me like, I mean, this is really what we're doing, right? We are calling it multiple times. So there's no speculation around it. Um, and I mean, this whole thing is called stream observer. So there's probably a reason why this implemented that way. Um, ultimate way to test it would be to debug the client and then see how often on next gets called in the client, because that's something we've seen in our client implementation. Um, I think it was in here. In the job polar. This is also a stream observer for the exact same protocol message here. And um, this also is implemented in a way that we have on next which gets an activate jobs response. And maybe that's the deal that this response will be sent multiple times really. Um, this and each response that we what, that we get will come from a different partition. We probably don't see that here. 
or do we? Activate job, what is the job object here? I oh, know that's an object. Activate drop impel. Now, I mean, we have the workflow instance key and the drop key. We could, in theory, compute the the uh, partition out of the keys, and then we could visualize that in the client. There's some weird bit shifting operation that you can use to get the. Uh, Partition key order. Order. Well, I mean, that's that, that's pretty much how the gateway correlates the complete uh, command, right? To the right yeah, partition. Yeah, exactly. This, this is a brilliant move because that way you don't need a state on the gateway, but the, yes. the key itself tells you exactly where this thing belongs. So, um, it's like yeah. IPv6 contains the route and the address. Okay. Do they do something like that as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's how IPv6 works. Cool. Yeah, it's probably a fairly a fairly common thing to do, but um, thinking about how you would implement such a gateway, um, this is exactly what you would want. Because that way you can also scale the gateway. It's completely scaled, stateless, um, have multiple gateways, and they, they don't have to synchronize among each other. They you can round robin them and everything, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cli clients. That, that, that's something that, there, because at the moment to set up, um, you know, load balancing for the gateway, you, you got to do it architecturally. It wouldn't be that difficult to implement it in the client. Only thing is, you have to implement it in every client then. Um, but shouldn't it be sufficient to have a load balancer that just supports gRPC? Yeah, Which I think exists already. And then really do it the traditional way, like you would do it with uh, standard HTTP. Okay, so um, this looks pretty solid in the sense that we don't wait too much for the jobs to arrive, but stream them out immediately. Mm. And that then could. Uh, um, erase our whole discussion from earlier if we are streaming jobs then it doesn't even uh, it's not even a problem how many of them we are streaming like well it could still be a problem if we ask one broker for a thousand jobs to activate so it still holds true that this single activation on a broker is a, an expensive command if the number is too big and yes there is actually already a, an, an issue. Let me try if I have that somewhere. Hmm. Yeah. So there's a discussion going on in engineering of whether this might be a bad approach that we're doing it sequentially and that we um, ask for all the jobs and on one partition. So, right, this is the scraped here as well. Let me go a bit screen size yeah okay yeah. yeah get an activate job request with this maximum jump number um we get the list of partitions we iterate over them and then for every partition we um send exactly this job batch activate command to the leader process the response if anything we send them back the immediately here is again reassuring and um, yeah, it's kind of, we want to ensure we don't have too many jobs. But this is even an interesting question, whether this is a problem if we would activate too many. In the, in the interest of balancing and parallelizing, it could be a good idea to yeah, maybe even if we activate too many, it's it's not a big of a big uh, such a big penalty compared to waiting too long until we have all the jobs together. I don't know if this is where the real. I mean, how much time does this take, and do and can we measure that? 
at the moment because we might be optimizing the wrong thing. Is there any way to measure how long it takes? Like in the client, you can you could make measurements and stuff. Could we measure this in the in the server? Could we instrument it? Um, we already have that instrumentation, so we can measure how long a job activation takes in general. And then one could, of course, do some comparisons between different configurations. So yes. um, I think the worry about acquiring too many jobs is load balancing across workers. So if you if we assign too many work uh, jobs to one worker, another more worker might starve out, and therefore you might have uh, yeah both problems with throughput and latency if you don't use your worker capacity good enough. On the other hand, this is a small problem compared to yeah, asking for a lot of jobs from could a single broker. Could we run could we run it and see how, how fast it is? Is that possible? Hmm. I don't know how that how it measures it because I didn't see any code in there that, that would measure it. We don't measure it, this particular part. We have metrics, um, for example, on the gateway side that are measuring the, the latency. There's a, no, actually, is it on the gateway side? We have an exporter that can collect metrics on, on job activations. And there is also some gRPC metrics available. Now, I think in the interest of time, um, I will not do experiments right now. I might okay. do them later today, but uh, it's, it's not the first thing on my list. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's obviously some balance and a, a good way could be to split it up, right? The one idea here is to say, well, if, the, if let's say a hundred jobs are requested, we divide it by the number of partitions and then run requests in parallel. Mm. And I mean, there's no reason not to do the parallelism here other than if you're scared that you get too many activations. And then that might be a topic, right? Because once you uh, um, enabled, uh, once you activated a job, that is a, an event that is recorded. So, and there the retry counter is decremented, the timer is running and stuff like that. So you don't, you cannot roll that back easily in the gateway if you see, ooh, now I did it in parallel and I got way too many jobs. Yeah, exactly. But maybe there's, that there could be a room for error margin here to say, hey, if you asked for 30 and I gave you 40, it's not the end of the world. You just got a little bit more to handle now. The client, and in, in at least on the Java side, has an unlimited queue on a fixed size thread pool. So we'll just get them queued and that's it. Sure, there could be limitations in how long the jobs can run. But for the average job, I would say this is even this isn't so much something that worries me. So then we would we would change that new variable from like um, you know, max jobs in request to give me about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you'd say give me about twenty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like roughly, or I mean, the <laughs> gateway could do it as well, right? Take the maximum. Take eighty percent of that and then spread out with such a parallel query. And if you are, I mean, again, this, this could be then fine-tuned. If you see that all your partitions are full, you just do the num magic, the, the numbers as in here. If you see that you don't get enough jobs together, maybe increase the number of requests per partition. Next round. Something like that. Mm -hmm. ah, maybe not. Let's not be too smart on all the pace. <sighs> <laughs> Complex system that's impossible to understand because <laughs> every every part of the distributed system is guessing what's happening. <laughs> yeah, and then it like either performs like magic or just terribly. It's like nothing in between. Yeah, and there are some. And it's it's difficult because. Some things need to be balanced out globally by setting the right configuration parameters. Yes. And 
then afterwards it, some things can can be done through black pressure and the like so yeah i guess you have to start with a base configuration that is sane and then from there there can be some room for balancing you know, in in real time i'm not sure if you can get to a stage where all the system is completely self adjusting to any load that you throw at it you could if you had you run it in black magic mode and it has a machine learning <laughs> neural network that that scans prometheus and you dump all of the metrics from every part of the system into prometheus and it makes predictive adjustments to configurations and then all of the components are listening over a web socket and it just reconfigures them dynamically <laughs> it's called the zero conf mode <laughs> Uh, and what kind of hardware do you need to run that one? <laughs> <laughs> the, that, for that part, you need a quantum computer. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of the ones that they let you know they have, but one of the other ones. <clears throat> one of the ones yeah. that you never get to hear about, except in sci-fi movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I guess this illustrates a little bit to, to how how complex the system is yes. once, once it's really distributed. Design um, trade-offs. Yeah. Anyway, so this is an idea. Um, I'm obviously subscribed to that to see if, if that could be moving. And uh, obviously, engineers have more ideas on that. Um, let's see if there's anything more that we can see in the code here. Yeah, actually, it would be interesting to see the long polling variation of that, right? Yes. So mm, mm, let's just mm, see. Mm, I think this loop was pretty much complete. It's fairly simple. Here we go. I'm going to subscribe to it too. <laughs> wonder if I'm subscribed to everything. Yeah, I'm subscribed to it. I think I'm subscribed to everything in this repo since I'm a member uh, of an org. Yeah, but issues? Should you be receiving any issue, every issue? Mm, let's have a look. Remove active control methods. Yeah. It says you're receiving notifications because you're watching this repository. Maybe I need to unwatch it. Yeah, I think I'm I'm watching it in release mode and then just get the issues that I'm actively watching. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yep. I set mine to that. Oh, I hadn't started. <laughs> That's pretty weird. <laughs> All right, uh, I think, yeah, this is pretty complete. Simple loop, all the partitions stop when you have enough jobs or stop when all the partitions have been iterated. So there must be some way to, to, to reset the iterator at the end. Or maybe the iterator is just initialized with the right starting partition and then will end. You know, if I started, let's say, at partition two, this round, then I'm going all the way around until I reach partition two again, and then stop the iteration. Because this thing does stop when there is no next. Oh, there's also back pressure. Was exhausted. That's on activation. Hmm. Okay, so activate jobs can can get a uh, wait. This yeah. is then which parameter is the thing? Resource exhausted was present. Uh -huh. It seems it seems to just collect that information. Interesting. Okay, yeah, interesting. And then it sends back one. So it's kind of good also as well, if it gets back pressure from one of the partitions, it will just continue with the next one. Okay. But what does it do with that data? Does it get reported somewhere or does it change its behavior? We will never know because it's just sinking into the stream and so I think this resource exhausted is somehow 
Well, I think that that uncompleted except is a um, that by consumer, right? Yeah. Oh, uh huh. Which takes an integer or a boolean? Well, it looks like an integer and a boolean. So by consumer, so it means it consumes two things. Ah, okay. So it's the remaining amount and this, and that's uncompleted. So where does that get passed in? I mean, that ultimately uncompleted, uncompleted, uncomplete. Ah, yeah, here we are. Oh, it just goes to response observer as well. That's weird. It doesn't even do anything with those data. And this is a lambda. It gets invoked with two parameters, but it doesn't care about those parameters and simply invokes uncompleted. Okay, so it looks like, yeah, it doesn't, it's observing resource exhaustion, but it's not doing anything about it. Maybe the long polling implementation needs those. You would think that this one here could signal back pressure to the clients, right? No, it doesn't have to because back pressure is not relevant um, on a job acquisition, right? I mean, sure, if you're polling too hard, that could be a problem, but due to long polling, you don't have to care too much. And even if you're polling too hard, well, yeah, no, you, it just means you, if you, yeah, okay. The long and it's polling a would be. As well, right? So if one of them gives you back pressure, it, that's okay. If the other ones still have jobs, then you just answer this request from the. Mm, but what about this scenario, though? They all give you back pressure and you get no jobs back. So you ask for some more after 100 milliseconds because you got capacity. Now you're just hammering the cluster and yeah. you don't get a back pressure. Mm -hmm. Yep. But that is something that maybe the gateway should handle. Which is what we're looking at here, right? So the gateway should signal back pressure. No, no, it shouldn't even signal because, um, we have we have an uh, there's actually a release that probably not many people know about. There is a 020.3 release, and in there we tried something with the gateway to handle this back pressure. Um, mm -hmm. it's, and we're not yet sure what will be the final solution for it. But um, the problem is if you have a broker with that gives you back pressure, it might also take a while to to like you more you want to kind of take that that one out of the loop for a while so you could react with a, with a back off strategy to this back pressure from a broker so you don't hammer it with job activation requests for a while I and see. rather balance the load towards other nodes yeah okay and this so the job strategy, activation yeah and this strategy is just going round robin. So when it does the, the next round, it will still go back to that node again and then maybe ask for, for jobs again. And so instead of the client reducing the general polling interval, which could make sense if, the, if there's really nothing working, if, if all of them ex give back pressure. But since that is maybe unlikely, it would be better to just you know move on with the remaining ones. Or let the gateway decide then what would be a good strategy. So if really all partitions give back pressure, maybe mm. the gateway can slow it down because it's already a long polling request, right? Mm. So um, okay, but everybody's I mean, using long polling these days, so that would be the real. Well, they don't have a chance because the gateway does it, right? The the only way to control not to have long polling is to have a shorter timeout. And the default client timeout is 20 seconds. Hmm. 
Oh. Yeah, that, that that parameter in there named polling interval is kind of misnamed now. It's kind of more like polling debounce. Um, yeah. Well, because it's the between the it, between the polling. Yeah, yeah, I guess that is yeah, that's that that is correct. We're we gonna have a look at the uh, the long polling implementation. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, I think I might grab a drink for this next section. Hmm. Let me do Back that too. Okay. <laughs> this is where I put on um, be back soon. I can do that actually. Um, let's have a look. Dun, dun, dun. Mm, do this. What does this do? Wait. Here we go. Love it.
And I'm back. Ecam. Yeah, I can turn off my back soon. There we go. Awesome. <clears throat> Good. You know, since you are not here, I've been talking, mm. thinking, but I was on mute. So <laughs> looks are like you been talking on mute. Um, yeah, I have my little hardware mute button here, and obviously uh, I pushed it when I dropped the mic. Okay, great. Um, that's good because you missed all all what what I said, and well, everybody missed it, so I might as well just start again and say it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was so proud of me that I was so fast with my water bottle and <laughs> could. Uh, bridge the time while you were away. Anyway, um, let's go back again to the gateway. Um, so right at the start here, um, we saw that there's the check if long polling is available um, or enabled. And then we build a long polling handler which is built by this uh, lovely little builder down here. And the interesting bit in here is that we do have some defaults. We have a default long polling timeout of 10 seconds. That's the time the gateway will try to answer a request. After 10 seconds, I would assume we see that the gateway just closes the request and would then wait for the client to restart it, which uh, the client will do in, you know, after the polling interval is elapsed at maximum because we as mm. we've seen yesterday the polling interval is not a delay between requests it's just a time at which polling is tried so it's a fixed rate in the in the worker so every 100 milliseconds by default the worker will try to poll if a long polling request is still open it will obviously not start another one but as soon as this polling request gets closed by the gateway next time it tries it would then reopen the next request and start polling again so basically what you see with long polling is that the clients just reopen the requests every 10 seconds in if there are no jobs and obviously if jobs are available then they get the responses and then ultimately the gateway will close the uh, response when the maximum number of jobs have been provided to the client and then it's up to the client to decide when there is capacity available again so that then it starts polling again all right, then we have a probe timeout. I don't know exactly what that's about. We will hopefully see that. It's 10 seconds as well. And mm -hmm. we have an empty response threshold. So apparently there's something going on if we get too many empty responses. Um, I might assume from the broker um, that then maybe also we have some way to terminate the request. All right, that's this. Uh, the rest is the instantiation of this long polling acti activate jobs handler. Um, interesting bit of this class is it's also implementing the extra um, or it's extending an extra interface or base class, which means it can also be used as a threat to run um, on a thread pool, which is which we see here right after the initiation, uh, the, the building of the long polling handler, it's submitted to the actor scheduler, which will run it on a on an actor thread. And that is, yeah, because the normal long po the normal job activation is always triggered by a client, but now when the client is when we switch to long polling we have to kind of do things on behalf of the client. So we have to have actively, we have things that need to be actively running um, because they're not triggered automatically by a next request. So that's that. Let's go back in here, activate jobs handler. So the thing is instantiated. One interesting bit here was uh, it does use the round robin jobs handler internally. So the moment we are creating the long polling handler, we also create a round robin handler. 
So let's see then. Yeah, on actor started is obviously an event that is uh, triggered whenever the, the, the actor got scheduled. Um, we will subscribe to a, an available job topic, which means this is uh, a way to receive push notifications from the broker uh, as soon as uh, jobs are available. And um, here we can see yeah, now the actor schedules itself to run at a probe timeout. Okay, so apparently this is then used to stop the actor. Or maybe the actor is kind of, uh, how is this? No, yeah, we'll see. Well, this probe, uh, probe timeout. Now, let's come back to that later. I think that's not the entry point. I think the usual entry point will be, as uh, we have seen it before in the uh, job activation handler, um, activate jobs, because that is the method that gets called by the by the API, right? The client comes in, wants to activate jobs. We already know how that looks like. We have an activate jobs request. We have a stream observer. Um, This is interesting. We now have a long polling request. Which takes these guys and forwards that request to an activate jobs implementation. Interesting. Yeah, okay, so we come in here with a normal request. We package it into a long polling request. Does that have anything interesting? Um, now we have a request mapper. Here we are receiving the usual data from the job to be activated. Cancel check. Mm -hmm. This is probably important because the client can cancel. So we need to then be aware when the client close the connection that we stop our stuff here. By default, it shouldn't happen because the client timeout is 20 seconds. Long polling timeout is 10 seconds. Therefore, we should receive something and, uh, and that should allow the gateway to close the connection first. Um, okay, then there's some handling going on in here. On complete. Mm. Don't find that too interesting yet. Let's follow up here with the activate jobs. Um, now this is taking an the actor and runs a lambda on on a, on another thread. Um, get job type state. this to okay I think this is just metrics I oh, know it does also work on failed attempts here Okay, so apparently for each job type, we're keeping an in-flight state. That makes sense. So um, this would count, what is it? It says the job type, 
has some metrics um, and has active requests. It's a list of active requests for the same job type. That's obviously interesting because we might have multiple workers coming in with the same job type and asking for jobs. And then the long polling, yeah, has to aware that there are many workers waiting for the same job type. Mm. Um, then what do we have here? Active requests to be repeated. Uh, don't know what that is about yet. And pending requests. Okay, we need to see a little bit. And then we have a last updated time and failed attempts. So yeah, that flight gets initialized with this job type. Uh, wait, get job type state. Yeah, compute if absent, so then we create a new one here. Although this one doesn't know the worker, it just takes the type and the metrics. Uh, but we maybe we'll update it then. Okay. If failed attempts, failed attempt threshold, I think that was the one where we had the default of three, was it? Let me see here. Minimum empty responses. Exactly. It's a little bit misleading here because the variable got renamed. Failed attempt threshold is the same thing as this empty response threshold. Okay. Um, back to where we were. Yeah, activate jobs. So apparently if we had more than three failed attempts counted in here, then we will uh, stop it here. Complete or enqueue request. That's interesting. What does enqueue mean? Okay, so this is apparently the, when when long polling is is kicking in. So we have a trace lock here. Worker asks for jobs, none are available. A request will kept, will be kept open until new jobs. Right. If this would be what you see in a log file. Um, so I guess what we have here is we have. Step get failed attempts. Yeah, we probably need to see when this is set. So this somehow if we did some attempts, then we fail it and we enqueue the request for later. And if not, we will first go in here. get the topology we add request to the to the active state which probably means we are currently in the cycle of asking the broker to um, to to fetch jobs whereas a pending request is probably some uh, a request that we parked until we get to it and ask the broker. Mm. Because again, when we acquire jobs, that means we have the broker will remember which worker is working on it. And the request will contain the worker ID, for example. So we can't just go out to the broker and say, hey, give me all your jobs. And then somehow the gateway decides which worker it would assign it to. Um, worker assignment is done by the broker based on yeah, requesting it for a given worker. Okay, so 
so we remember this is an active request. We get partition count um, and then go into our round robin mechanism and just do a normal round robin based job activation. And now I think our remaining amount and con uh, the resource exhaustion come into place. The both handlers have the same API. And while the round robin one didn't really use these things, here we are now using them as feedback mechanisms to inform what to do next. So on completed, we'll now check what's going on. If the remaining amount equals the maximum jobs to activate. So here we can see maybe a problem with having not exactly a match between remaining and, and requested jobs. Rem remember we had the discussion earlier where we said, ah, it's not really so bad if we activate a couple of more, well then that's how it is. Mm. This, this condition at least would need to be modified. Probably would be more safe to put uh, an, a greater than or equals. Naja, but it's a detail. So we check if we met uh, all our requests, then we are done. Oh, that's interesting. It does check for the um, <clears throat> resource exhausted there. Yeah, let's look at that for in a second. Um, first, I wanted to check when, when we are done here, we received in, we used the round robin standard polling and we received enough jobs. Then we can directly complete the request remove the active request and reset failed attempts and handle pending requests. Okay, so exactly. So we would then go back to our state, reset the failed attempts and then come back to our list of other clients that might be working and that might be waiting and start processing a, a one of the pending requests, I guess. Yeah. It's a stream for each. We just get one of them and we call activate jobs. And activate jobs will be again going in using the round robin implementation to try and activate them. Okay, that's cool. So now let's look at the interesting case. We did not. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, did I. mess that up so the condition is if it's equal remaining amount equals max jobs to activate i think that is we we didn't find anything yeah that means we didn't find anything if we did find them then it's fine then this will be Uh, wait a second. What are so we then trying? it sends, sends back pressure by the look of it. So if remaining amount is still equal to the maximum jobs to activate, that means we didn't find a single job. Yeah. You know what makes it easier to understand and code like this is you do constant didn't find any jobs equals remaining amount equals request dot like that. Like turn it into a named Boolean. Mm -hmm. That's what I usually do. Yeah. Um, or put the entire check in a, in a, in a private function. Method. Yeah. So that would be the idiomatic way to do it in Java. Uh, no jobs found at all. And then if this condition is not met, it will mean that we did find some jobs. We did a full sweep through all the partitions with a round robin. So we also know that we found all the jobs that are currently available. So we can then just um, return to the client exactly and then come to the next one, which could mean, well, if we found, uh, if we found a lot of jobs 
like if we made the request uh, full, then uh, it's good. There might be more jobs. And if not, the next pending request might hit this condition and not find any jobs. And that's the moment when we need to go into the more advanced modes here. Mm. So if we did a resource exhausted, then what do we do? We remove the active request. We will have an error message. Mm -hmm. Response observer. So that means, okay, wait, this is interesting, right? We did not get a single job back mm. because of back pressure. And that's the well, moment when we put back pressure to the client. I, I don't know if it's necessarily because of back pressure. It's just that we got no jobs and at least one of the partitions. Yeah, that's true. Gave back pressure. At least one of them. That is true. So, um, and, and that is the moment when we give feedback to the client rail of looks like you're in trouble or looks <laughs> like the broker is in trouble. Yeah. Um, and now, hmm. There could be an edge case where just one of them gave back pressure, but the other ones are still fine and they might have new jobs and soon. But that, 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 maybe that's not too much of a complicated situation. It's more likely that many of them give back pressure if you reach this point. Hmm. You know, how likely is it that you get back pressure from one broker and then, yeah, okay. If Nothing. It's a, if you have a rare job that doesn't uh, come in that often, but other things are, are hammering the system. But yeah, anyway, this is how it is. I think it's good. We do get, if we have, I mean, if there's nothing coming back and we have back pressure and then it might be good to report that back to the client. I'm not sure if our client does anything about it at the moment. Um, that would be a chance for dealing with uh, back off strategy, um, I think, or do we do something? Let's look in the client. Um, I think it just throws. That would be the polar. Um, oh, look at this. Retry predicate. What is our retry predicate? Where does that come from? That was usually in the retry predicate, retry timeout plus deadline offset and retry time. Oh, I know, request that, that's, all right. So 100 milliseconds by default plus one second it was. <clears throat> Retry predicate comes from the builder implementation. Okay, that's an important one. Um, you see here, if if you got an, if we need a new access token, then uh, it would be good to retry. Otherwise, it returns false. 
But I think this is just, okay, this is just one way why a retry would make sense, right? Um, but let's see if this is somewhere. Um, if we try predicate test, Paul, else if open supplier. Yeah, okay, you will get. So it looks like at the moment we will only retry in the worker if there was an authentication issue that indicates that we need a um, a new auth access token. That's particularly relevant for Comunda Cloud. Um, other than that, we'll just stop the polling for this time. And then obviously we will schedule the polling again in our normal delay. Okay, makes sense. And uh, well, if we got an authentication problem, we just do an immediate retry and that will trigger getting a new token. Makes sense. And obviously for the job acquisition, it's not that bad because we do that in a polling loop anyway. Interesting would be retry behavior for other types of problems when we, when we are receiving this back pressure. Okay, um, let's go back to the broker. Yeah, this is where we were. Um, it's interesting that we are throwing a broker exception in the gateway. But that's simply how that how resource exhaustion is looking like. Mm. Yeah, now I'm wondering how how my implementation responds to that. Yeah, and here we see also from the error message at least one broker return resource exhaustion. Please try again later. I mean, in your case, don't you also have some kind of polling interval that would re just reschedule the polling at some point? I do for the synchronous methods. I'm not sure about the streaming method. Yeah. I wrap the synchronous methods in a retry uh, function. They, they get wrapped in this function called execute operation. If you have retries turned on, which is, is by default, you can turn it off by setting retries to false, but if it's true, it'll wrap every operation that's a synchronous gRPC call in a retry machine. Polling, however, is its own case because it's the only streaming method in the in the API. It's something for me to look into. I'm also inspired by this actor, um, this actor model, because I think I've I've implemented something similar to the actor model in in the Node client, but just sort of by hand, rather than like using a formal framework, yeah, like the design pattern, sure. the design pattern of the actor. Mm -hmm. Because it really is like state machines, you know, and then logic, and then an API surface. Mm. <clears throat> and there is a JavaScript uh, actor model library. Might look into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's one other case in our condition here. We didn't receive any jobs. There was no back pressure involved. So probably the system's just empty. And um, that means we will uh, run this method here, which will increment the failed attempts now with a timestamp. Um, Sh 
should be repeated. This request, remove it from active request, and then, yeah, if it should be, oh, wait, should be repeated is interesting. Um, active jobs to be. A request should be repeated if the failed attempts were set to zero because new jobs became available whilst the request was running. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, we will come slowly but surely into the more interesting part of this. So far, we just came in with a job. We, we, we did the round robin strategy. And well, we didn't get any results, right? And now, um, while we are arriving here, they, they, there's a race condition, right? So we are iterating through all the partitions. Mm. And while we are looking at the last partition in our list, maybe the first one had new jobs. and um if that happened it would be marked as to be repeated and we would pick it up here um which would go into activate jobs again right away do a round robin again if not happens what happened before we removed the active request and then put it into our um, job type state uh, complete what, or in queue. What causes it to be marked as should be repeated if you got no jobs from it? We will look at that in a second. Bear okay. with me. So basically, complete or in queue request will just uh, push this in. We will check the timeout of the request. And this would be the version to then send it out once the timeout is reached. Um, but I think, wait, no, if not, is timed out. Will be kept open until new job, until timeout. Yeah, okay, got it. So um, this is just. We take some logging and, and, and queue it into our state. And it could be that the request was already scheduled earlier and has a timeout. Then we don't need to do it again. But on the first time, we will also add the timeout to that request. Remember that we need to kill that request in time. Uh, what does a timeout do? Yeah, it just so this is the actor thingy here is pretty similar to me like the executor that we've been working with in the client it's just a different way to do this it's a thread pool and we can just run stuff on it immediately or delayed yes so, um yeah um in this case yeah run delayed uh request timeout which is yeah some stuff that gets executed based on time. Don't care too much about it. So the important thing was this one here and queue request will add this request to the pending requests unless it's not already in there. Pending requests offer. And this is probably just a queue exactly. So nothing to see here. It's a queue, we push it in, end of the story. Now, I think this was a, this was pretty much the end of a request that came in. The thing is just queued in the pending requests and that's it. We didn't find anything, it's queued. Now your question was already like, what does it, how, how, how would this thing ever wake up again, right? Yes. Um, 
And that is, I need to search for it. I think I've seen that code before, but um, to look a little bit into it. No, that's the request. That's the handler, right? So we have mostly seen the part of this handler that was the activate jobs handler part. Like, you know, there has, there's the method activate jobs, which gets invoked if, on an incoming request and then does an immediate query to all the brokers and tries to uh, answer the request. And we've just seen that if it doesn't find anything, it just queues this request. So there must be some other part in here that that is interesting. And one thing is already, we have this uh, one on actor start, we have a subscription to um, a job available notification. Mm. This sounds like an interesting bit, right? So um, we subscribe to some topic and we subscribe the method on notification. So it looks like whenever a job is available, this will be notified. And then this will be notified based on a job type. And with this, yeah, maybe you can look into this. This is a broker client, uh, open implementation. Uh, let's use the real thing. Uh, so this goes to Atomics. Um, describes to a dedicated topic. And I think if I understand correctly, this topic is being pushed to by every broker whenever any job gets available. So that then mm -hmm. now the gateway can retrieve a trigger when a new job is available. It will be on notification and it will contain the job type that received. Uh, receive jobs available notification for the type. In our case, would be payment received. So, and then um, we reset failed attempts and handle pain pending requests. The name already says everything. Um, yeah, we reset the state for this job type. And then Probably, yeah, uh, if, re if pending request is empty, we don't have to do anything, I assume. Ah, no, um, there could be also an active request. In that case, we are actively, uh, I don't know, where the hell is this? If pending requests is empty, ah, okay, that means that is house cleaning, housekeeping here. If we have no pending requests and no active requests, then we remove the job type state because that job type is apparently not being requested at all. So this is how we can also clean up. For example, in case a job type has been retired in the system because a new version of the process doesn't use that job type anymore, that way we could clean up our memory and don't remember anything about it. Mm. Um, or also just in the longer time, if for example, the job workers are all turned off, we can remove the job type, but it's probably just cleaning some memory. So now the interesting bit is more this one. Pending requests is not empty. So we get the stream of pending requests and for each of them, we go um, and run activate jobs. Hey, and I've got a uh, 7 p.m. meeting that I have to go to. I think minutes, I can still leave. Yeah, I think I can still leave this running though. You don't have to, we are done. We're done? <laughs> that was it. Look at this last line. We just received that notification and we trigger we trigger the job activation, which will then okay, so it's subscription go based. All the code just seen. Okay. Okay. So all they did for adding long polling then is they put a like a subscription state machine around the the synchronous activate jobs, which was the short polling version. Exactly. Yeah. I mean it's really just you you remember which requests are pending. And you have only one active request at, at any time. And uh, yeah, the only thing that was needed was this 
push notification from the brokers. If any job is available, then you just trigger the polling. So it's really behaving in the end in the same way as if you just received a request from the client. Mm. You know, what would be interesting for us to look at next is there is a an issue open for the spring Java client that sometimes it takes up to a second to activate a job or five seconds or something, which mm -hmm. it doesn't look like it could be from the broker side, right? And it's not because you can run the node client alongside it and it has no such problem. And supposedly the spring client just wraps the, um, let me see if I can find it. Just yeah, that's wraps my understanding. The, it just wraps the Java client. So I would probably be interested to see the exact configuration. But I shoot it over if you can find it. Um, I, I am, It might be related to my current customer, so I'm interested to look into it. Yes. Okay. I'll shoot it across here. Awesome. And then maybe we can have a look at that next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Awesome. Great deep dive. Yeah. And a quite abrupt end in the, in the end. Boom! Landed it. Okay, I got to yeah. bounce to my meeting. <laughs> hey, brother, right. have a great day. You too. See you in the next one. Have a great evening.